Hello, everyone, and welcome to our great panel session that I'm really excited about. My name is Cody Seif, Vice President, Co-Founder of the Functional Aging Institute. Really excited to have you guys with us today, and thank you for, uh, for turning out for our Active Aging Rehab and Fitness Summit, very first one that we're doing. So super excited about everything that's going on, and definitely, uh, I'm just, I'm ready for this session. This is going to be such a good one, uh, where we're going to talk about fitness as therapy, therapy as fitness new models of integrated care and i've got two people that can really speak well on that because they're out there doing it so i want to welcome patrice is on who's coming from good old north carolina south carolina huh south. oh south you're south, south carolina. Carolina. Oh, carolina south carolina yeah. that's even better that's even deeper yeah. south. then we go go the yeah. other direction yeah. 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 who's yeah. in canada coming where are you in ontario Kingston, Ontario, yeah. Kingston, yeah, okay, that's what I, that's what I was thinking. Well, welcome, really, really appreciate you guys being here. You know, one of the, the purposes of, of our uh, whole, in, whole event is really to try to bridge the gap between therapy and fitness. And, and even before we, we hopped on here, we were having this conversation about the need for that and how uh, I think that need is gonna keep growing as we move to the future, as the older adult population continues to explode globally, and everybody knows prevention and wellness, right? Prevention and wellness, before care, after care. We gotta get this continuum going here um, in, in all over the world. Uh, you look at even just data of what's happening in other countries, and you guys might be from, you know, tuning in from some other countries. You know, the healthcare situations certainly vary, but it's the same thing. Older adults need this continuum of care to prevention, to care, to post therapy. I mean, we, we got to do it. So really excited that we have two people that can speak to two different models of what they're doing um, with wellness and integrating fitness and wellness into their therapy practice, especially with older adults. So before we get started, we jump into the details of what they're doing. And you're going to really tune into the details of what they have going on, because it's really interesting is I want to ask you guys, what was really the impetus for you to do something other than just a traditional physical therapy clinic, right? So you both are running physical therapy clinics, right? So it's not that you're not doing that, but what really compelled you to say, hey, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to integrate this whole fitness and wellness piece uh, for, uh, for older adults. So Christina, why don't you kick us off? What kind of, what kind of drove you to that? Yeah, so um, I started my private practice gym hybrid model about four and a half years ago. And when I was a new grad as a physical therapist, I got into a very traditional model of outpatient orthopedics. And I was working with a lot of older adults. And what I saw happening was that when you were in that program of care, people would be getting stronger, they would be becoming more resilient, their capacity would be increasing, I would feel really great. I would discharge them like community dwelling older adults, and then they would decondition. And then they would be back in my practice three or six months or nine months later. And I didn't necessarily think that this was the best model, even though I loved working with older adults. And so I actually went back and started my PhD in 2015, looking at high intensity resistance training in older adults who are at risk for transitions in mobility status. And my randomized control trials were all being done in groups. And a secondary component to my PhD work was looking at the role of physical therapists in health and wellness. And so I combined some of the group-based exercise programming that I was doing as part of my thesis dissertation, and I added this umbrella scoping review that looked at where is the state of the literature in terms of where we have true evidence that PTs can get involved. And essentially what I did is I combined those two things to generate our business model. And so it's no surprise that the idea around prevention and health promotion with older adults in different arenas, false prevention, maintenance of neurological condition, all those types of things had fairly significant evidence from a secondary and tertiary prevention perspective. And essentially we just started building programs in groups in the community that, that highlighted those niches and those needs. And here I am four and a half years later. What was what is your personal fitness background? So I have been active in strength based sport for the last twelve years. I have done pretty much every strength based sport you can imagine. So I have done bodybuilding. I have done CrossFit. I have done powerlifting. I am a national level competitive weightlifter in the sixty four kilo weight class. 
And so I have been involved in resistance training very heavily for a long period of time. And so it felt like a very natural fit that I would be focusing on that as the component of the exercise program that was the most interest. Yeah, so you, you personally had kind of a, a lot of experience, obviously, in resistance training methodology, programming, all that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I was a fitness instructor. I did Zumba. I did personal training um, all the way through. When I graduated from PT school, I did a year of strength and conditioning internship at my local university. To just, I did my CSCS. I did starting strength. I did so many exercise based certifications to try and build that. Yeah. And then I took my clinical hat and tried to blend it with some of what we know around functional resiliency, aging physiology, and those types of, of like different um, constructs for yeah. uh, translating that to older adults. Interesting. Can you can you do Zumba and powerlifting at the same time? Is there like a power Zumba combo <laughs> class, maybe something like that? <laughs> I'd like to see that. Uh, maybe without a barbell, but our rest periods could all be Zumba songs, I feel. <laughs> Great. All right, so Patrice, what about you? You're not a, a competitive uh, weightlifter, no. are you? No, not at all, not yeah. at all. So um, I've been a physical therapist for over 20 years, um, practicing in a wide range of settings and seeing over and over how we um, discharge, you know, we work with our patients, they get better, we discharge them with the home exercise program, and then they end up needing to come back in a few months because they're not maintaining their exercise. Um, I would also argue that the whole concept of giving someone a piece of paper with, you know, like five to maybe 10 at the most exercises, that is completely insufficient to keep someone well. We know that you need aerobic strengthening, balance, and flexibility in order to stay healthy and well. And so when we turn around and we gave our, give our patients this home exercise program, that is not sufficient to keep them healthy and well, even if they did do it but they don't do it. So that, you know, just practicing as a physical therapist, you know, for all those years in a model that I knew didn't work, all of my colleagues, we all know it didn't work. We knew that like, you know, we're working with the patient, you're putting together the home exercise program, knowing that they're probably not likely to do it, but I do it anyway, because I feel like that's part of my job. I better give them the home exercise program. Um, it just was a, clearly something that was not working. And so for, I mean, for years, years, I actually thought like, this is, you know, obviously not working, but you know, you're busy with your life. You're just doing your job. And, but then when I had the opportunity, my husband was really supportive because I was expressing to him like, you know, this is, this never, this is not just not working. There's a better way. I have a background in group exercise. I've taught group exercise for years. And so I personally love group exercise myself. And so I was just thinking, well, why do we always have to do everything one-on-one? -on -one? Why can't we try to incorporate things in a small group setting for, for fitness and wellness and continue to follow our patients? The other thing is when you're dealing with someone with um, the ability that has declines in multiple systems, um, short-term care is not enough. I mean, you have to be able to continue to follow them. So we need to be able to kind of follow our patients along, which is what we do now in our, our um, business here, is we don't ever really discharge them. They continue to exercise with us and they continue as our patients, well, not really as our patients, but as our members as part of our program. And so there's really a blend of the group exercise and the PT and there's that constant oversight. And so it's just a wonderful, wonderful model. But to answer your question, what brought me to do this was just frustration and, and just knowing that the old system was not working. So you're, you're, you both kind of saw that boomerang effect that, yeah. that kept going on of discharge coming back. And do you guys, have you ever guys experienced like frustration kind of at the reimbursement system and the kind of limitations or some of the shackles that, that are kind of put on you? For the group exercise? No, just for just your therapy reimbursement. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, right. But I also feel like there's a better way. I feel like, you know, that way that even just how it's set up is a little bit inefficient in terms of how to use the funds. So um, I feel like we could make a, do something better than that. Yeah. Sorry, Cody. I don't really have a ton of intricate knowledge on the reimbursement models because our models in Canada are yeah. it's like night and day different. Um, our private practice model is, is more, more similar to a out of network type practice that gets reimbursed by insurance without deductibles. Mm -hmm. That's kind of so. Do you, still, you don't, do, you have, do you still have limitations on like how many sessions you can provide over a certain number, amount of time? No, you don't. Okay. 
No, in our private practice model, like everybody, after I finished teaching any of the courses or talking to any clinicians about this, they always say that they want to move to Canada because our reimbursement models are way less stressful. Um, the onus is on the clinician to make a judgment call from um, as long as people are willing to pay. So once they've kind of exhausted any of their private insurance coverage, they can continue to pay out of pocket with no disruption in service. Yeah. or they can choose to end their episode of care. So it kind of just depends on your employer, what your, 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 your reimbursement model will look like, how much money you have. So there is mm -hmm. a little bit of variability that way, but well, that, that, yeah, it's, it's similar though, because at some point you, you're paying for it yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, I mean, it's kind of similar to, to what we were talking about. At some point there's people who got to take it on and, and pay for the services uh, on their own. So let's talk a little bit about your, about your models. Cause you guys have, there's some similarities, but there's certainly some differences in, in your models and your approach. So, uh, Christina, again, we'll just kind of come back to you. Share with us what you're doing. Yeah. So at Stave Off, we are taking a, a very highly preventative um, approach to our model. So we have kind of traditional one-on-one -on -one care, but we definitely have a bias or a known bias in our community that we are very exercise and active management focused. And when you are seeing us for physio, you can see us kind of in isolation for an injury. You can start with us in one-on-one -on -one care and bridge to some of our group exercise programs, or you can begin in our group exercise programs. And so we kind of oversee our group X programs and our ideal client is probably between 40 and 70. So we tend to have quite the spectrum between um, individuals who have kids that are a little bit older versus people who have grand or grandkids that are a little bit uh, younger or older. And so our programs kind of reflect that. And then our group exercise programs, again, based on that systematic review, we focus on older adults. We have our, it's called Conquer, and it's an arthritis specific program where a lot of our older adults with multimorbidity, chronic conditions, chronic musculoskeletal pain will enter into. Um, but we also have things like Strong Like Mom, which is like a postpartum exercise program that's overseen by pelvic floor PT. So we kind of go a little bit across the, the lifespan. Our, we have a large portion of our members are kind of in that 50, 55 plus age cohort, uh, but we do have other things. Your facility is uh, very, would you say kind of CrossFit styled from like what you explain that a little bit. Yeah, so we have 3,000 square feet of open gym space. Uh, we are, all, all of our um, resistance training and group-based exercise is without use of machines. So we have barbells, dumbbells, kettlebells, bands, and just body weight types of exercises. And so a lot of our, our work is a combination of strength training, Kind of that supportive accessory like i want to say physio but it's kind of like those supportive stability type exercises and then um, aerobic conditioning that's usually more high intensity in nature with high intensity being relative to the client so we we kind of have those three things encapsulated within the 45 minutes to 55 minute time zone but that's changed a little bit with covid um but we um we have definitely kind of encapsulated that into an hour so Definitely there are some things that would be kind of similar to the CrossFit model. We've removed a lot of things that especially for our demographic, we just didn't think were the most appropriate or needed for our population. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just for our group, um, like putting, we don't really put like heavy barbells in a conditioning circuit or anything like that. We do that at the very beginning where we're controlling rests and all that type of thing. But, but if you looked into the gym, you would definitely think that there was a lot of similarities with the Model. And how many people do you have in a group, uh, typically, kind of a range, like do you have a maximum? And who, who's teaching those? Are physios teaching those or do you have fit pros teaching those? Yeah, a combination. So we have, uh, now we have between eight and 10 people max. Usually our older adult programs are between five and eight. And our physios will cover those classes and so will our fitness professionals. Uh, we have a, a really good relationship with our fitness professionals and my husband did kinesiology as his degree. So he kind of manages the gym side of our facility mm -hmm. and he is just so good around exercise modification. All of our staff are fitness professional and physio um, to make sure that you're, you're catering the exercise program to the needs and backgrounds of all of our clients that are coming to see us. What's been the response from, from your clients? 
So we tend to, well, one, we have a really strong community, which is really wonderful. Um, so that part is great. Um, we tend to get a lot of people who have tried other fitness facilities and have gotten hurt and they get a little bit of security from having the oversight of the PT. I don't know, uh, Cody, if, if you've seen this, but sometimes just having or knowing that physio is there, if there is any requirement, most of the time, nobody needs it. Um, there's just a, this sense of comfort mm. I, that that comes with having the, the bridge between physio and gym, and gym being in the same facility. So we tend to have a lot of people who do have chronic issues. Like we have individuals with neurological impairment. We have yeah. issues, with individuals with chronic low back pain, individuals that have, you know, been hurt in fitness facilities in the past and, and just want that sense of comfort, I think would be the best. Um, yeah. And do you have clients, I, I'm assuming you're, you're marketing, right? You're marketing these programs. So you have kind of different pathways, right? People can come to you for physio and kind of then migrate into your wellness programs, but then the other way around as well, right? They come in for fitness and then you realize, oh, they got some issues that could probably use some therapy, right? Kind of goes both ways. Yeah, absolutely. And some people will come into our gym and simultaneously sign up for physio because they want that crosstalk. They they want that therapeutic, manual therapy potentially focused rehab and then be able to do the work in the gym that supports that goal. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. All right, Patrice, your turn. Tell us a little bit about your program. So again, you do have some similarities, but there are kind of some striking differences. I've, I've probably a lot of based on your backgrounds because your background is more group exercise, right? Right, right. And um, geriatrics really specialize in, in geriatrics. Um, well, six years ago when I did open my business, I really opened with the idea, of, of course, with the group exercise. I really wanted to try to offer a different type of service and to try to use my physical therapy knowledge um, in a small group setting to try to keep patients well. So as I started with this new idea that, you know, no one else that I knew of was doing, um, uh, I, you know, put out ads and things um, in the newspapers and people started answering ads, you know, my ads were like, you know, do you have difficulty with your balance or, you know, things like that. So people would come in and when I would meet them for that wellness assessment before they went into the group classes, I was finding time and time again that these patients actually needed individual therapy before they were really ready to transfer into my group. And so while I wasn't intending on offering individual therapy to begin with, um, it became clear that either I was going to be referring patients out continually or I need to change my model and my, you know, what I'm offering in my business and um, offer individual therapy as well. So therefore I went ahead and changed, you know, got uh, credentialed with Medicare and all the other insurances and such and um, began to do individual therapy and group exercise. So these two things go together so well. I mean, it's such a great model. Um, having the two services in one big gym is excellent because like I said, the group, people come in for the group exercise. A lot of people, we don't think about this as physical therapists. Um, a lot of people don't even know that they need physical therapy or they could benefit from physical therapy. They just think, oh, my balance is bad. You know, I just, but they don't realize that they actually could use physical therapy. So when they would come in and we would start to do the wellness assessment, then that's when we would introduce, you know, I think you could use a little bit of individual therapy before you go into our group, you know, sessions. And especially when you would tell them that it's covered by insurance, that really seals the deal that um, usually when they find out that it's covered by insurance, they're really wanting to go to individual therapy. Um, they're, because the group classes are not covered by insurance yet. And so they have to pay for those out of, you know, cash base. So um, the model is basically offering the group exercise classes that are designed by a physical therapist at different functional levels and offering different types of classes. So we offer, and these, this kind of just developed through the years of trial and error and trying to see what would work for our patients that were coming in. And um, we offer uh, wellness classes. So we, uh, one category would be wellness classes. And those are classes that contain the aerobics, the strengthening balance and flexibility. So we use music and we use music um, with a lot of co um, coordination challenges and balance challenges. And it just really makes it fun actually. So we have um, a group of exercises that are the wellness classes that we really recommend everyone takes at least one wellness class uh, two to three times a week. And then we offer some additional things like yoga and Tai Chi and core and some other variety because we um, have a membership. So people join our program on a membership. They pay $100 a month to come to our group classes. 
and then we run um, kind of simultaneously we have the group classes and the individual therapy going on together and what has happened is that when people come in for individual therapy they see the group classes and so as they see the group classes they it, like they can look at the patients or the members that are doing the exercises and they look just like them. I mean, it's not this a nice setting. They think, oh, I can do this because they look just like me and it's nice and safe and they feel comfortable with it. And then in terms of a delivery of physical therapy, I feel like it's a really efficient um, type of care to have um, a model where perhaps one, you know, you might start off three times a week or two times a week with the um, frequency, but then you taper down to maybe you would get one time a week of one on one and then maybe you could add a couple of classes and kind of transition them into the classes as you are approaching the discharge. And so then when by the time they're discharged, they're ready to kind of seamlessly go into the group classes. And the group classes really provide a social component that is so very important as well. So, um, and that social component helps to make them adhere to exercise too. And how many, how many people are in your classes? Um, usually we have anywhere between like five and 12 would be the most. Mm -hmm. So it may be around eight. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. That's good. So, and you have some pictures you can show us? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Get those so, images pulled up. What I think, while, while you're kind of doing that, one thing that, that I think is so missing in the traditional physical therapy clinic is especially during that transition period, like they've gotten better, they can use more robust, just physical activities, but you have to kind of tell them, okay, go out and be active. You know, you can't say, oh, here, here's something that you can do right here with us that's gonna accelerate your improvement, but also hit on other areas that you need that maybe you're not getting therapy for, right? But are important. So I think that's, that's awesome to have that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a, a, a great model and it's so needed. This is a little lunch and learn we um, provide um, for our members too. We really make it a big um, kind of a sense of community too, and it really is for our, our members. Um, yeah, so you can see some of our parties and stuff and go back. How big is your space, your exercise space? Um, it's 3,800 square feet. So you can see there's our clinic right there. Yeah, so you, you both have a good amount of space to work with. Yeah. Yeah. Which has been very helpful in COVID-19. Yeah. <laughs> Keeping <laughs> everyone out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear you. I think one of the things too, um, Cody, that I, I'm sure Patrice, Patrice, Patrice sorry, could, could relate to as well is this sense of comfort that, that can start sometimes with your clients when you start working with them one-on-one. -on -one. Because I think for a lot of older adults, especially um, with with bigger gym facilities, it can be extremely intimidating to come in. So I know a lot of my older adult clients, they know that they need to be exercising. They know that it's super important. I always make the comparison that exercise is like a medication. You would never just stop taking your medication. You need to make sure you're, you're still taking your exercise prescription. And, but once you develop a relationship, it feels, there's a sense of comfort about transitioning into the gym facility yeah. because you know you already kind of know what the facility looks like you have probably interacted with some of our gym staff while you're working with the clinician uh, the clinicians probably had you in the gym working one-on-one -on -one, so you kind of have seen classes i tend to try and book my clients that i think are going to want to transition into that class around when they would be taking class so i introduce them to the people Ooh, who you're being sneaky class. huh uh -huh. Yeah, I might have a, I might have a little bit of, a, of an idea. I like it, yeah. That. <laughs> but then they, they, they already know, they look just like the person that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm working with. So it doesn't look like it appear instead of, you know, a 21 year old who might be extremely intimidating, you know, like all those things are very consciously done and, and it helps just make that transition a little bit smoother, a little bit less intimidating. Because sometimes like the further you get from ending therapy, before stepping in the door of a fitness facility, the less likely you are to do it, for one, because you kind of get into your old habits and routines. And, and you can almost sometimes create this roadblock, block, this mental roadblock around actually stepping foot in that facility. So even if you don't have these hybrid models, I think it's really important for PTs to have at least one or two personal trainers or people that they know that that focus on working with individuals who are older or or have a good knowledge base around working with geriatrics so that 
you can at least make the introduction on discharge, for example, yeah. and like do a group email because that that just so exponentially increases the likelihood of them continuing. If you part of your discharge planning is also making sure that they are comfortable in whatever their next transition is. Yeah, yeah. There's there's new um, uh, guidelines from the World Health Organization, which is the the ICOPE guidelines, which is integrated care of older persons, and they they're recommending like physicians do a mobility screen, for example and then figure out if they've got some mobility issues. And if they do, then obviously they can assess them, but really send them on to a therapist, right? In order to address those things, they really stress the, the whole referral pathway. But where, unfortunately, what they don't go into is post-therapy, what's the pathway after that, right? You gotta keep doing the stuff. We know if you don't keep doing it, you're like, you're just gonna boomerang back. You're gonna decline. Um, and the home exercise programs, they're, they're well-intentioned. They just, they're, unless you have somebody there to support you, guide you, motivate you, progress you, you know, we see that, that they just kind of really don't do it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think either, it's either got to be referral within your facility, which is really the opportunity that you guys are capitalizing on, right? Because you're keeping them in your facility, you're generating revenue, and you're there to care for them when they have to then have other issues that come up. But if right. not, you at least have got to find those fit pros and those facilities that you think, okay, these people know what they're talking about. You know, for years, a long time ago, I would, I would speak really bad of, of my own peers in fitness. Like, yes, most people are just don't know what they're talking about. They're a bunch of, you know, whatever, uneducated. But what's happened over the past 20 years is, is there are a lot more people in fitness that are really good. They've educated themselves, even without having like an advanced degree they're, they're just knowledgeable, intelligent, well-meaning, caring people. They're, they're in all communities, right? So we need to find some ways to connect with these, but also too, is those are, those people, I think prevent, present opportunities even for therapists to start a program, right? If you can find one or two of those, you've got people there that could run a program in your facility, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Patrice, one of the things that, um, you were talking about your classes a little bit, so, Christina was saying you had you had um, a, kind of some different types of classes or focus on different areas, and you mentioned you have like some specific Tai Chi classes and balance classes, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Yes. So d d tell us a little bit more about some of those class options that you have. Sure, sure. Um, what what I found like when I first opened Group Hub you know, six years six years ago, I um, kind of marketed to the um, athlete, the senior athlete, in addition to basically just um, seniors in general. And what I found was the clients that were coming to us were really the clients that were a little bit more functionally impaired. That's where I found the need was. And so the patients that come to our, our clinic are not really um, your senior athlete type or you know kinds that are going to the sports club. There are people that have a lot of arthritis. There are people that, um, you know, have, trouble with their balance and have a lot of mobility issues. So um, we offer for different classes, we offer different um, functional levels. Um, the wellness classes I mentioned, we have a whole series of those. So we offer classes um, for aerobics where people might be at the like the first class we offer where they're holding onto a bar and reaching out and doing some aerobics and then um, doing different types of strengthening exercises and okay. um, to where someone, the higher level class is pretty higher level, you know, a good low impact class. Um, <clears throat> then in addition to that, we offer the classes of the yoga. So really adapted yoga. And what I did is I um, used physical therapy knowledge, like what I would do with an individual patient who might have balance impairment, who might have arthritis, who might need to work on posture, all those kind of things and um, kind of combine that with yoga poses. And so we have adapted yoga and then we have adapted Tai Chi and we have core for um, patients with a, a range of different core classes. We found that with our um, clients coming here, the core, they like the core in the chair. Like, so we do a lot of standing and seated core exercises. Um, we do offer a mat exercise core class as well, but I've, a lot of our patients are really quite frail that for them to do a bunch of core work in the chair and standing, um, seemed to be something that was very popular that they really, really enjoyed. Um, the yoga, the chair yoga is hugely pop popular. Um, and then we offer a basic like general strengthening arthritis type of program too. So you're, you're, you would say you're really serving uh, much more of the frail, pre-frail, or even kind of lower independent type person? 
Yes, very much what so. What about you, Christina? Do you feel like, is that kind of your primary population or do you have a kind of a larger spread just in the older adult group? I would probably say we were more in the pre-frail category. Okay. okay. So you really found that that's a kind of a, a, a niche, I'm going to say. I hate calling the older adult market a niche because it's the biggest market. But within that market, the, yeah. the frail, pre-frail group kind of being a, a part of that market, you find that's kind of the, the winning piece for you guys? Yeah, I can't, I can't speak to Patrice's model, but for us, I, I just have this like passion for really trying to reach people before they've gotten close to that line. So yeah. in the summit, we're going to be talking, Dustin and I are going to be talking about one rent max living. And so we are trying to get those individuals before they're getting close to that line where their ability to maintain independence in their home is threatened. So when we, when we think about, you know, how we're diagnosing frailty, we have those five physical phenotypes that are things that are largely in a person's wellness assessment, right? Unexpected weight loss, fatigue and lethargy, slow gait speed, you know, low uh, muscular strength and sedentary behavior. If you have one or two of those, which I would say is a good portion of our older adult population is like, you know, increasingly sedentary, has a low muscular strength, whether it's reached a clinical significant threshold or not, like that is that, that, group that is either going to really be able to excel and really you know square the curve of their functional trajectory in their next two or three decades or they're going to be somebody who's going to get an onslaught of some sort of exacerbation of a chronic condition or, or some sort of issue that's going to scale spin them even closer toward that line of loss of functional independence so for for our um our group yeah we're probably in that you know trying to have one or two of those we're probably identifying them and then trying to transition them into a maintenance style program. Yeah. We do have people that are, we would consider like pre-frailty. What we don't really have are like senior athletes. So yeah. people yeah, are really like fit people. jogging, you know, five miles and things like that. We don't really cater towards that demographic. Well, that's, that's the thing is when you're, when you're, when you're fully fit, you know, even if you're 70, you can go out to a regular gym, like you're going to have the confidence, you're probably going to have the knowledge and experience to do that most of the time, right? It's really that other end of the spectrum that needs, needs so much more help. What we found, uh, this was interesting in our facility. Um, so we, when we first started, uh, we started with a physical therapist who had his own space in our facility, but independent business, but used our uh, floor for uh, exercise for all of his patients. And he focused a lot on older adults, not, not completely, but a lot. So it was a great relationship because, you know, even during an assessment, we could say, well, I think you, you really need to see the physical therapist about the shoulder issue, walk them over, right? And they could see the therapist right then and there. So it was a good kind of kind of back and forth. But what we found was, you know, we started with kind of the focus on lower functioning, but it kind of really grew and grew and grew. So now we have very fit older adults that want to work out where we are simply because of the different focus, the, the different environment, the, you know, we don't have the, the 20 year old bodybuilders in there, you know, running and, and that sort of thing, which kind of drives some people away. And there's, and there's just a higher level of care, you know? And so I think a lot of people just want, like you were saying with the, with the therapist, they feel better just by somebody being there, you know, if they're like, I probably don't need them, but it's good to have them you know, around, have that level of expertise, I think is awesome. Yeah, well, I think too, like as a PT and as an athlete, I have a nutrition coach and I have an exercise coach. I could a hundred percent do my own program, but I'm going to pick the exercises that I like to do, not necessarily the ones that I need to do. Yeah. And so having somebody else to hold me accountable makes me a better athlete, makes me a more resilient human. And so if I, I recognize that it's, it's easy to see why that would be necessary in different stages in a person's life, including, you know, trying to maintain that strength as, as especially when we know that we see that accelerated loss of muscular mass over age 70, that sharper slope of that decline, unless we're trying to mitigate it with physical activity. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you, because I think this is really important, uh, and especially for everybody that's kind of watching um, and tuning into this is what, what are, I'll, I'll kind of throw it out there for you guys to answer first. What do you feel is the true exercise expertise within the physical therapy community? So among physical therapists, what is kind of really truly the exercise knowledge and expertise from your perspective? 
I would say balance in walking. I mean, as far as I think like um, balance, vestibular issues, um, walking, functional strength, um, getting up out of a chair, um, those type of things. Is that what you're asking, Cody? Well, I just think, uh, well, Christina, what are your thoughts? Um, so I think in general, and I, I don't want to paint only PTs because I see this in the fitness profession. I think in general, our society can be relatively ageist against an older adult. Mm -hmm. I think fitness professionals, I have seen them only use pink two pound dumbbells with all of their clients over 65. There's this threshold that leads to this chronic under dosage across the spectrum. Yeah. So I think that there is still a lot of work to be done. When I say that my my research study is looking at getting frail individuals lifting barbells up off the ground. People are just aghast that that would be something that I would be trying to research. And what we're showing is that there's no negative adverse outcomes and that people are getting stronger, fitter, and more resilient. So I think in general, as a whole, um, for individuals working with older adults, the chronic under dosage is still more prevalent than I would like to see. It is starting to change. I've noticed in the last, particularly the last two or three years, there seems to be a lot more people generating momentum about the need to avoid this. And, there, and you know, there's several groups that are spearheading that, that I think is extremely important, but I think there's still so much work to be done. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, you know, one of the barriers that I see to this kind of merger is, is within the physical therapy community itself is in that PTs, and this is common in all allied health, too many PTs don't exercise themselves, right? They're, they're not doing it. They don't have any background in it. You guys have a background in it. You have an interest in it, you know? And so even seeing our students as they come through this program, you know, our doctoral program, you can tell there's some, they're fit and they're active and they want to integrate that into their, into their therapy uh, paradigm and others, no, right? It's like, you're making me do this movement stuff and I never plan to do it again ever for the rest of my life, you know? And I think that's a, that's a barrier, just like it is for physicians trying to promote physical activity when they're not active themselves. You know, I think that's something that we've got to overcome. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree too. I, I teach a lot of PTs. All of our phones are going off. <laughs> I teach a lot of PTs um, and our exercise assignments not only get them to do modifications for individuals with different musculoskeletal impairments, et cetera, et cetera. But we get them to load and we don't yeah. want light load. We want you to load yourself and do a self-assessment of your own movement. And there's a lot of people who haven't picked something up off the ground, who haven't squatted with a heavy weight on their back and weight is relative, right? So mm -hmm. if you're asking your client to work at 70 to 80% of your one rep max, and you have no idea what that feels like, then, then it's hard to, to kind of even do a properly dosed progressive course of care and, and transition that for, you know, for a personal trainer or for a PT. So yeah. I, I agree with you that, and the other thing, sorry, second last thing is that if you have a client who's at risk for impairment, it'll be easier to do a seated exercise program if you don't feel strong enough to help them if they were to slip or have a perturbation in their standing balance. You know, I had a client who was over 300 pounds and was starting to have to rely very heavily on a scooter because of back pain. And I knew the most important thing that he needed was to be standing the entire session he was working with me. So my, my other physios were laughing because I was braced as much as I could be. And I had him in standing in as safe of a situation as I possibly could. But I also felt very confident that if he was to lean on me or he was to have a perturbation that I would be physically strong enough to be able to move him in, at least into safety by guiding him into a chair or onto a bench that would allow me to have that that comfort to be able to progress his exercise program at, at the intensity and at the level that he needed. Mm -hmm. So what is what are some some advice that you guys have and uh, Patrice you can talk about your kind of your model program uh, sure. which I think that's very helpful is what what's some advice that you have for uh, both PTs and therapists or and fitness professionals that are they're interested in doing something, you know, like maybe it's they've been it's been rolling around in their head. I, I need to break out of this traditional model. I want to do something and kind of bring therapy and fitness and wellness together, uh, but kind of don't know where. How do I get started? How do I move forward? What's some advice that you guys have for them? 
do you mean like to try to have like a, a program like what I'm doing? Or? Yeah, if they're right. If they're they're wanting to do something um, outside of the traditional therapy box, they want to start including incorporating some sort of fitness and wellness program within their facility. You know, what's what's some advice that you would have for them? I would say reach out for resources. Um, you know, like the Functional Aging Institute has a lot of resources where you have that um, senior exercise specialist and things like that. Um, so I'm mean, not just that, that, but other resources as well. And um, then, you know, you probably know more than you think you know in terms of group exercise. You could try to do your own classes or you could reach out to other programs to try to um, develop classes. Um, so I would say also try to reach out to the fitness community itself. I mean, see what's already out there and see how what, you know, you almost have to kind of just think um, be like an entrepreneur, I guess, you know, like thinking like what is out there right now and what can I bring to the table with what I know? And then you have to have a risk. I mean, you just have to take a risk and you have to say, you know what, I believe in this enough. I'm going to go for it. And that's what you have to do. So we'll talk about your group have a little bit, kind of what you're offering. <laughs> sure. Um, okay, so like I said, I opened it quite a few years ago, and um, I opened with the thought in mind that um, a model like this didn't just need to happen in Simpsonville, South Carolina. I felt like this really was a problem that was throughout the country, that the way the model of care is, that short-term care with discharge to, with the home exercise program. So I kind of started to develop the classes and trying things and see what worked and what didn't and see, like, how can my person that, you know, has such bad poor balance, um, how can they participate in this group class and how can I get several people with, um, you know, multiple chronic conditions and things in one class and still give them a really skilled class. So I developed a program that we use um, in my clinic and I have some other therapists who are also delivering the same program. So um, it's also um, been researched and is about to be published in the International Journal of Geriatric Medicine. We had a research study that um, was conducted along with Anderson University. Um, so we have a big program actually and we have the reason why we have a program is also because if you're delivering a program it needs to be consistent so like if i'm a physical therapist and i am recommending the classes that the patients are going to go into that class pretty much needs to be delivered kind of the same way or there's going to be different functional levels and there's going to just it's not going to work so the physical therapist places the patient in the right class and um there's a wide range of different classes so there's a big offering because if you're going to ask someone to pay a hundred dollars a month for a membership you kind of want to have enough to offer them that they would feel like that's worthwhile and so um not to mention the fact um you know i completely agree with you that there's a lot of underdosing, absolutely 110 percent but one thing that i also find that's a little bit different about how we think about things in terms of physical therapy versus the group exercise is um these patients have to really want to do it i mean it has to be enjoyable to them and um you know when we we do try to push our patients in the class you know asking them to you know raise go, go up and wait and things like that so we certainly absolutely do do that but i know that they're also attending our class because they enjoy them you know they have fun and actually i do too i mean honest to goodness that is like really fun to teach those classes so um they have fun and so that's why they come too. they have fun and they so they're getting stronger they make friends they have really good friends we have a big bond here um so there's kind of more to this model than just simply what we traditionally think about physical therapists. I'm gonna, you know, follow the protocols and, you know, really get them stronger and get them. What we're looking at is more like long-term, you know, keeping them coming and keeping them where they're being as active as they can be and kind of considering like the spiritual, the social, the physical, all of it together. So it's kind of a little different that way. Um, so your group have um, model it's it's a licensed program right a licensing program yeah so you and you can get that either as an individual or a facility correct if you want to be a facility if you would like to be a facility provider if they have fitness you could offer let's say joe's physical therapy and have an offer be a their have fitness provider kind of like at a health club where you might offer zumba or something i mean that's kind of sort of an example uh, of the same type of concept but um so you would have your physical therapy practice and then basically i've already designed and researched and it's been published all of um, the data about our program so you wouldn't have to try to design all the classes yourself you wouldn't have to try to come up with a program you wouldn't have to have all the variety you could license our program 
and it's already we've been in business for um, six years last year we were um, awarded by South Carolina American Physical Therapy Association Clinic of the Year so um, out of all South Carolina so that was pretty exciting so um, we already have a program you don't have to reinvent the wheel you can use ours and we have the um, standardization too so we have the um, online training and then you can continue to become certified and you can have that training for your instructors in your facility if you are just one person and you want to become certified yourself and perhaps offer this in a, at a um, physical therapy practice that you know or like you wanted to go to a senior center you could come and you can become a certified therapy fitness provider and offer our classes in one of those places yourself and be like an independent contractor or something like that yeah so that's a great resource that can kind of shortcut your time you know, if I think about what do I do, how do I do it, go with yeah. somebody who's going to go with a program that's there. Yeah, yeah. it's already proven to work and it's already been researched, so yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, actually, if I would have had something like that six years ago, I might have you know, <laughs> taken them up on that, you know? No, that's what we tell me. Don't <laughs> reinvent the wheel. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. So. All right, Christina, what about you? What's some advice that you have for people that are thinking about doing something in this area? So let me tell you about what I did wrong, because I think you learn a lot from what you've done wrong. So when I first started at our own facility, I tried to start an older adult program in a CrossFit gym. And there were many successes to this program, but the thing I realized is that I cared more about my old program than potentially the owner of the business did. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I would say for your client is to try and see if you can find the right fit for your program. Hi, Cody. Hello. Hey. Hey, I'm back. Yeah. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened either. Who did me out? <laughs> you were boring me, so I just left. Yeah, fair, <laughs> fair. Um, okay, so let me just restart. So basically what I did when we first started to try and do an older adult program, I tried to kind of nest myself in with an already existing facility, which can be extremely successful, but I think there requires a really strong relationship and a setting of expectations when you come into that facility. So what we ended up happening was if, for example, the general exercise program was too big, we would get pushed out or we would be put into a smaller space and it just made our my core clients feel like they weren't they weren't being held to a priority. The other thing is that we were in a facility that was industrial and had 25 foot ceilings. So there was acoustic issues. It was very expensive to heat and cool, so they didn't. So my clients who had issues with temperature regulation were sometimes missing big chunks at a time because they didn't want to exercise in a facility that had like only open doors and it was super hot and humid. So I think that those are things that I wish I would have thought about and definitely were very conscious decisions when I started my own facility. So if you're looking to to start, like, you know, a seniors association is perfect, but sometimes you would be in a big gym. So if there is another program going on and you're starting your program, your clients may have a hard time hearing you if there's another activity that's happening at the other side of the gym. So I think, you know, thinking through some of those things and really having good conversations with whoever is either the program coordinator or the owner of whatever facility you're working to come into is really important and set those expectations on the front end. And that, that may look like, you know, what goes into the contract you guys write up between the two of you or, you know, just kind of those considerations before you decide to, to have a relationship with that facility. But it's definitely something that I wasn't aware of or wasn't consciously thinking of. I was just really gung ho and excited because I really wanted to start this program. So definitely something that would be my piece of advice if you are a therapist or a fitness professional who's looking to niche into having an older adult class wherever you're looking to have that. Yeah, yeah, that's good stuff. You know, I, I guess when I think about my advice, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of come back to kind of a big picture type of thing is this, this is a an almost guaranteed growth market. You know, this is an area that we know it, for, until the year 2100, the, the, the population, older population is going to keep growing and growing. And the fastest growing group is the 85 plus who definitely need not only therapy services, but they need this continuum to be hand in hand, right? That's, that's so valuable, so important. And then of course, all the just 65 to 85 year olds, obviously 
a lot of them need therapy, but also more prevention. And so I just think, you know, people are just, they get worried maybe about the entrepreneurial aspect of it. It's something new, something a little different than what they're used to. But we've seen you guys have done it very successfully. Other people have done different types of models very successfully. Um, even when we look at, um, you know, fitness professionals that are wanting to kind of start their own place. If you look around your community, there's probably very few facilities or programs that target older adults and then also do it well. You know, there, there's some kind of senior programs that are out there, but probably nothing. I think, Patrice, like you were saying, you have to have something valuable for them to say, I'm willing to pay for this, right? And I think what you guys have done are two great models for that, um, that, that are obviously successful. So, you know, my advice is to don't let that fear stop you. This is an opportunity. And I would say move quickly <laughs> to take advantage of the opportunity before somebody else does it, you know, right. the area. I think that's really important. Well, guys, really appreciate you being here. Um, great stuff. I, I thank you so much. And um, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get to chat some more, but I, I wanna let you guys have kind of the final word. What, what's kind of a final wrap up, you know, leave people with, with, with a certain thought or, or a couple thoughts? One thing I just wanted to add, I don't know if this is necessarily my final thought, but I just wanted to mention about COVID and with the situation right now, um, how basically COVID has actually opened up an opportunity, I believe, because I was only um, doing in-house classes. I mean, I really was not have, offering anything on Zoom or anything else. People were coming here, we were doing classes and it was great. <laughs> and then all of a sudden COVID came. So what happened is we now we offer our entire program on Zoom. So what this has done is this has opened up a huge opportunity and even looking forward, this is great for people that are homebound. Think about how many more people could participate and um, social isolation is um, such a problem right now. And I find like in our classes, it's wonderful because we, we have social distancing, maybe four to six people coming to the actual class. And then we have our, our computer set up and their Zoom. So they come in early, they talk before. And then when we're starting class, we like go around with the computer like, hey, say hi to Mary. Hi, Mary, how are you all? And then, um, yeah, then we start class. And what I, the feedback I've gotten from the people that are at home right now, you know, for afraid because of COVID, is that there's something they can look forward to every day at three o'clock. They know they're going to join with their friends and they're going to exercise. And so if we're thinking about long-term solutions that are viable, I mean, this is something that's just fantastic. So if you have a program, you can actually offer that online now. I mean, or a mix. I mean, for when COVID is taken care of, which hopefully won't be that long from now, but um, Zoom, I mean, this Zoom is here to stay and it has really plays a role and it's really been an opportunity. Yeah, definitely. Christina? Yeah, some of my final thoughts are probably around, you know, long-term adherence. So when the one thing that is a real big benefit that sometimes physios don't have the benefit of outside of our models is the ability to, to generate long-lasting relationships that don't have a start and end date. So as PTs, oftentimes we're thinking about episodes. Patrice and I are extremely lucky that we have these bridge programs, but recognize that if you're listening to this, we, many clinicians do not have that luxury. We wish we did. And so um, you have a very big opportunity to, you know, get into someone's world and be that strong relationship with them that they may not have a ton of people around them, especially that 85 cohort, you know, they've lost a lot of friends. They've lost a lot of family. They may have lost significant others. Yeah. And so you really do and can become not only somebody who is optimizing their physical resiliency, but is really touching their life in a way that, that caters to all spheres of health, not just the physical. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you guys, really appreciate it. And uh, really quickly, website. So Patrice, yours is groupab.com, is that right? Yeah, I actually have three websites, um, but yeah, I have um, groupab.com is my clinic. And then, you know, we offer Therhab Fitness. I have a Therhab Fitness website, so therhabfitness.com. And then I have a home Therhab Fit for older adults with um, that are looking for exercise classes. So Therhab Fitness would be the best place to go to find out more information about the program that you're offering to facilities right. and individuals, right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. And then, Christina, yours is staveoff.ca? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So you can see you and you you've got pictures and some videos up of your 
classes, right? I remember watching a good good video from your facility, so you can see more about what what she's doing as well. Well, thank you guys for uh, attending and, and being here with us and, and uh, coming to the Active Aging Rehab and Fitness Summit. I uh, really appreciate it. Wish you, wish you the best of luck. And hopefully you guys that are listening are more motivated, more compelled, more interested in, in getting out there and doing something, you know, just, just making something happen in this arena. And I know you can reach out to either of these two women. They'd be happy to talk to you, help you, you know, email them. Same thing with, with FAI. If you've got questions, you're like, I, I'm interested. I think I want to move forward. We can help you get into those resources that will that'll really help you and connect you with other people that are doing it. So thank you. Appreciate it. You guys take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that.